Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is power distribution of parallel AC circuits. Our objective is to examine several illustrated examples of parallel AC circuits, including analysis of power. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with both parallel AC circuit analysis and AC power calculations, as illustrated in the AC circuit analysis playlist, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you lack the requisite level of familiarity with these topics, please review the aforementioned supporting material and return to this lecture when you are so qualified. Mastery of power calculation and parallel AC circuits necessitates active participation on your part, and as such, I'm encouraging you to please pause the lecture when asked to do so and attempt the example problems on your own. If your answers do not match those illustrated, by all means, feel free to rewind the lecture and correct any mistakes you may have made. Our first example problem features a parallel combination of two elements. The first element is a 330 ohm resistor, and the second element is a 12 microfarad capacitor. Stage one of this example problem necessitates we solve for the voltage drop across each element, the current through each element, and the source current. Once we've got these values, we'll move on to stage two and examine power distribution within this parallel circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try stage one on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The complex impedance of the 330 ohm resistor is 330 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. The complex impedance of the 12 microfarad capacitor at 60 hertz is roughly 221 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. It can be said that supply voltage equals V1, which equals V2. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this parallel circuit suggests that source current equals I1 plus I2. Now that we have established a basic framework for this parallel AC circuit, we can move on to solve for individual desired properties. There are several ways to obtain these desired figures. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of Ohm's law, followed by a subsequent Kirchhoff's current law analysis. Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z1 equals 363.6 mA at an angle of zero degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another for this purely resistive element. A second iteration of Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z2 equals 542.9 mA at an angle of positive 90 degrees. Phasor diagram illustrates current leads voltage by a full 90 degrees for this purely capacitive element. Note the smaller impedance magnitude Z2 appears to be drawing more current than the larger impedance Z1. Given the nature of a parallel circuit is dominated by the element drawing the most current, one might expect this larger circuit to exhibit primarily capacitive characteristics. Additionally, given voltage across elements in parallel is the same, the larger amount of current drawn by the capacitor might yield a larger apparent power figure for the capacitor, whereas the smaller amount of current drawn by the resistor might yield a smaller apparent power figure for the resistor. Given these two applications of Ohm's law, we now know the current through both elements. Application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that source current equals 653.4 mA at an angle of 56.2 degrees. Note the phasor diagram indicates source current leads source voltage by 56.2 degrees, thereby cluing us in that the combined impedance does have primarily capacitive nature as we anticipated. As a means of checking these calculations, one could solve for total impedance, where the parallel combination of Z1 and Z2 is found to be approximately 183.7 ohms at an angle of negative 56.2 degrees. Note the total impedance does indeed appear to be primarily capacitive, given the negative angle. Using this total impedance figure, another manipulation of Ohm's law also suggests source current will be 653.4 mA at an angle of 56.2 degrees. This matches the figure we obtained previously with Kirchhoff's current law. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our voltage and current calculations are correct, and we can move on to stage two of this example problem. Given these voltage and current figures, see if you can calculate the apparent, real, and reactive power for each individual element and the total parallel circuit. Recall, power calculations necessitate the use of relative phase shift between voltage and current. Luckily, voltage across elements in parallel is the same, and we're employing source voltage as our reference. This means we really don't have to worry about the conversion between absolute and relative phase shift as we do with series circuits, and we are ready for liftoff. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, 
you should have obtained the following results. Let's examine each individual element in turn, and then take a look at the whole circuit. It can be said, current through the resistive element Z1 is in phase with the voltage across it, and there exists a relative phase shift of zero degrees between voltage and current. As such, for this purely resistive element, we should anticipate all of apparent power to be directed towards real power, and none of it towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 43.6 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the resistor is directing 43.6 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the purely resistive nature of this particular element. Given there exists no relative phase shift between voltage and current, all apparent power will be directed towards real power. Let's now examine the capacitive impedance Z2. It can be said current through this capacitor leads the voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. As such, for this purely capacitive element, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 65.1 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this capacitor is directing zero watts towards real power and negative 65.1 bars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of a capacitor. Note the complex conjugate operation accounts for the negative reactive power sign. Although I personally loathe this terminology, you'll sometimes hear people referring to a capacitor as supplying reactive power. Let's now examine the larger circuit. Given our larger circuit is composed of only two elements, one consuming 43.6 watts of real power and the other supplying 65.1 bars of reactive power, one might anticipate the total power to be the summation of 43.6 watts and negative 65.1 bars. Let's see if this is the case. It can be said that source current leads the supply voltage by a relative 56.2 degrees. Total apparent power is the complex conjugate of source voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 78.4 volt amperes at an angle of 56.2 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates real power is 43.6 watts and reactive power is negative 65.1 bars. Note total real power is the same value as that consumed by the resistor and total reactive power is that same value as supplied by the capacitor. This is far from a coincidence and illustrative of a very important fact. Apparent power input equals apparent power output. For this two element parallel AC circuit, total apparent power equals apparent power to element one plus apparent power to element two. ST equals S1 plus S2. Note apparent power can be considered as having both a magnitude and a direction. Counting for angles, the apparent power delivered to the resistor is pointed entirely in the positive real horizontal X dimension whereas the apparent power delivered to the capacitor is pointed entirely in the negative imaginary vertical y-axis. Accounting for direction, the summation of apparent power delivered to these two elements yields a total apparent power figure of 78.4 volt amperes at an angle of negative 56.2 degrees. Importantly, this figure verifies our earlier total apparent power calculation. Alternatively, one can solve for total real power and total reactive power independently using a similar technique. Total real power input to this system equals the summation of individual real power outputs. PT equals P1 plus P2. Similarly, total reactive power for this system equals the summation of individual reactive powers. QT equals Q1 plus Q2. Doing so yields a total real power of 43.6 watts and a total reactive power of negative 65.1 bars. Importantly, these figures again verify our earlier calculations. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence we're correct and can move on to another challenge. Our second illustrated example problem features a parallel combination of three elements. The first element is a 470 ohm resistor. The second element is a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. And the third element is a 250 millihenry inductor. The source has an effective value of 40 volts and an excitation frequency of 150 hertz. Stage one of the example problem necessitates we solve for the voltage drop across each element, the current through each element, and the source current. Once we've got these values, we'll move on to stage two and examine power distribution within this parallel circuit. 
by all means, pause the lecture and try stage one on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The complex impedance of the 470 ohm resistor is 470 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. The complex impedance of the 2.2 microfarad capacitor at an excitation frequency of 150 hertz is approximately 482.3 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. Finally, the complex impedance of the 250 millihenry inductor at an excitation frequency of 150 hertz is approximately 235.6 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z3. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. It can be said that supply voltage E equals V1, which equals V2, which equals V3. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this parallel circuit suggests that source current equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. With this important groundwork established, we can now begin an analysis of this larger parallel circuit. There are several ways to obtain the desired figures. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of Ohm's law, followed by a subsequent Kirchhoff's current law analysis. Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z1 equals 85.1 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another for this purely resistive element. A second iteration of Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z2 equals 82.9 milliampers at an angle of 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current leads voltage by 90 degrees for this purely capacitive element. A third iteration of Ohm's law suggests that current through impedance Z3 equals 169.8 milliampers at an angle of negative 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current lags voltage by 90 degrees for this purely inductive element. Given three applications of Ohm's law, we now know the current through all three elements. Application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates source current equals 121.6 milliampers at an angle of negative 45.6 degrees. As a means of checking these calculations, one can solve for total impedance, where the parallel combination of Z1, Z2, and Z3 is found to be approximately 329 ohms at an angle of 45.6 degrees. Note that the total impedance appears to be somewhat inductive given the positive angle. Using supply voltage and the source current we obtained using Kirchhoff's current law, a manipulation of Ohm's law also suggests total impedance will be approximately 329 ohms at an angle of 45.6 degrees. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our voltage and current calculations are correct, and we can now move on to stage two of this example problem. Given these voltage and current figures, see if you can calculate the apparent, real, and reactive power for each individual element and the total parallel circuit. Again, recall power calculations necessitate the use of a relative phase shift between voltage and current. Luckily, voltage across elements in parallel is the same, and we're employing source voltage as our reference. This means we really don't have to worry about conversion between absolute and relative phase shift as we did for series circuits, and we're ready for liftoff. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Let's examine each individual element in turn, and then take a look at the whole circuit. It can be said current through resistive impedance Z1 is in phase with the voltage across it, and there exists a relative phase shift of zero degrees between voltage and current. As such, for this purely resistive element, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards real power. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is a complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 3.4 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components, demonstrates the resistor is directing 3.4 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the purely resistive nature of this particular element. Given there exists no relative phase shift between voltage and current, all of the apparent power will be directed towards real power and none towards a reactive interchange. Let's now examine the capacitive impedance Z2. It can be said current through the capacitor leads the voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. As such, for this purely capacitive element, we should anticipate all of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 3.3 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this capacitor is directing zero watts towards real power 
and negative 3.3 vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of a capacitor. Let's now examine the inductive impedance C3. It can be said current through the inductor lags the voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. As such, for this purely inductive element, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 6.8 volt amperes at an angle of 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the inductor is directing 0 watts towards real power and 6.8 vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of an inductor. Note the complex conjugate operation accounts for the positive reactive power sign. Again, although I personally loathe this terminology, you'll sometimes hear people referring to an inductor as absorbing reactive power. Let's now examine the larger circuit. Given our parallel circuit is composed of three elements, one consuming 3.4 watts of real power, another supplying 3.3 vars of reactive power, and the third absorbing 6.8 vars of reactive power, one might anticipate the total power to be the summation of 3.4 watts minus 3.3 vars plus 6.8 vars. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of source voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 4.9 volt amperes at an angle of 45.6 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates real power is 3.4 watts and reactive power is positive 3.5 vars. As a means of checking our work, we can also summate individual apparent powers, where total apparent power equals S1 plus S2 plus S3. Accounting for direction, the summation of individual apparent powers delivered to these three elements yields a total apparent power figure 4.9 volt amperes at an angle of 45.6 degrees. Importantly, this figure verifies our earlier total apparent power calculation.